UFC 293 is in the books, and um, let's start with the positives. The card was as good as it was going to be. Like, we got the best version of Volkov to Ivasa, possible. We got Kopp versus Dos Santos, and it was really, really fun. We got the best version of Tafa Lane. We got the best version of Pedro versus Turkali. We got, like, the best version of a lot of different fights here. Uh, at least the main card. The undercard, not as much. Like, Olberg versus Da Jung, that was perfectly fine. Uh, Jenkins Mariscal was fun. Uh, until we got a gross, <laughs> a bit of a gross injury. Uh, Malarkey versus McDessey, bit lame. Hawk Paras, Quinones, that was a good fight. Radke, Blood Diamond, eh. Miranda got a quick submission over uh, Shane Young, so that's cool. And Josette versus Kiefer Sutherland was pretty good. Not, not Kiefer Sutherland, Kiefer Crosby. Sorry, <laughs> Kiefer Crosby. Um, so we got like kind of the best version of in-cage results that we were going to get like the the quality of the fights was there for what was on the card and that's awesome now let's get down to the to the downsides um so i am going to say this very simply i do not care what a what a ufc fighter thinks politically socially etc as long as they're not actually committing crimes whatever However, I am going to say that I do have a problem. I, I really dislike Sean Strickland. <laughs> and, and the reason I dislike Sean Strickland is not his view on guns or his view on homosexuality, his view on the porn industry. Um, realistically speaking, because in a perfect world, we would just ignore all that. That That is my take. Like in a perfect world... No one would care what any fighter thinks, politically speaking. Sadly, we don't live in that world, but we do live in that world. What I will never fully, and, and, and I know I will never be able to manage this. I will never be able to, re- to, 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 to get the appeal of Strickland. What I mean by that is Sean Strickland's character bit gimmick to use professional wrestling terminology is this out of control crazy psychopath guy it's not just that he's a jerk it's that oh he can't help himself like that is that is the idea that that is literally his statement like if i wasn't a fighter i'd be in jail if 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 i was here with this person talking smack with me Right now, I would beat his. I would. I would. I, I would do terrible, terrible things to him. That's like the gimmick. And then you watch him go out there and fight, and it's the same fight every single time. Like that's that's the funny thing is that this this performance where he beat Israel Adesanya. There are people like on Twitter, on social media, who are like, "Well, what you don't really understand is." There's a lot of film out there on Izzy Adesanya and really Sean Strickland and Eric Nixick. And believe me, Eric Nixick's an amazing coach. Amazing coach. But it's a lot of the idea of like, oh, well, they just, they, they found the weaknesses. They, they studied him really well and they broke it down and they, they, they found the silver bullet to taking out Israel Adesanya. But they didn't. <laughs> he went out there. Watch Sean Strickland versus Jack Marshman. It's the same fight. It is the same fight. And it's just, it was such a letdown to watch Israel Adesanya just never get going. I gave him the second and the third round. And I think he definitely had got the second round. Third round was a push. But he got rocked in the first round. He got put down. I was like, I'm nervous. He looks fine in the corner. He looks ready to go. Wins the second round. Okay. Has a competitive third round. Okay. Okay. And then the fourth or the fifth round, he just keeps getting his shit pushed in. He just keeps getting walked down by Sean Strickland while trying to get his reads and getting pressured against the cage and broken down and beaten. And to be clear, like a lot of the times when a big favored champion loses, it is 
about the other fighter. It is that fighter finding the magical silver bullet. Rose Namajunas versus Joanna, for example, was a fight where like Rose went out there and it's like, wow, she really actually does have like Joanna's tendencies down and she's ready to capitalize. I, I, I'm not saying that Sean Strickland wasn't ready for like to capitalize on Izzy's tendencies. I'm saying he didn't have to. I'm saying he got to go out there and fight for 25 minutes of Sean Strickland classic. Sean Strickland, what you get every time is this out there. And it was so mind-boggling to watch that work. Honestly, it was so confusing. Congratulations to Sean Strickland, though. You are the champ. Seems like he's actually already bored of being the champ. And you got the big win. And and and, and he handled the post fight with, with like as much class as you can really expect. That was nice. But like, I have so little to say about the fight. It was just Izzy did not get going. He get just he just got endlessly, endlessly pressured while he was looking for reads, and it's like. I don't know why you need more reads. This is this is the Sean Strickland game. Are you ready for this? Come forward, jab cross, or lead hook cross to set it up. Occasional kick to the body. Loves that like thrust kick that like, you know, to the to the gut. He loves doing that. And then defensively, move my head slightly back, like, like maybe an inch, and and parry. And, and lift my leg up if you kick it. That, that's the Sean Strickland game. He just did that for 25 minutes. My God. I don't, I don't under, I don't understand. I, my, my entire understanding of like MMA was just broken in that fight. And it's not because I'm wrong because, or it's not just because I was wrong. Like I'm wrong about a lot of fights. They don't destroy my like just confidence in everything like this. It's just, Izzy fought really badly. Really, really badly. And please, God, don't give him an immediate title shot. Do not give him a rematch. He does not deserve it. He just got his belt back from Alex Pahea, making a lot of terrible uh, fight IQ decisions in those two fights. And then he goes out here and does this. Wow. Just, just, just wow. Um, as for, um, uh, as for what's next, I mean, okay. Yeah. The rematch is on the table. That's what was said by, uh, by Dana White. What I would do is Jared Cannonier versus Sean Strickland for the belt. They had a close controversial, uh, fight. Cannonier went out and had a great performance against Marvin Vittori. Strickland wants that fight back. He said as much. And Cannoneer is in a position to 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 take it. Um, you could also do DDP versus Strickland, but I I would I would do Izzy versus DDP. That's what I would do. Even without the belt, I think that that fight has a, amazing business upside. Amazing business upside. The other option, I guess, would be like there's the Chamayev Costa fight coming up. Winner of that could get a title shot or get Izzy. Those are on the table. So there's a lot of stuff that you could do here. I guess that's the nice thing is that like it does it really does open up this division to a lot of different things. But I it just it just absolutely boggles my mind that I watched a man that I I do think is one of the best strikers in MMA go out there and have nothing, nothing at all for Sean Strickland. That was it's. I, I, I don't I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So I'll, I'll move on to the next fight. Uh, Tai Tuivasa versus Alexander Volkov. Volkov worked him over. Uh, he kept him in range. He liked working the body te- body kick particularly nicely. Just absolutely just beat uh, Tai Tuivasa up. And then eventually they go to the ground. Volkov gets dominant position. Volkov locks up an Ezekiel choke of all things. Gets the submission. Shouts out Alex- Alexei Olenek after the fact. Awesome. Dope. Great. Um, more or less what I expected to happen. Um, it's just the, it just comes down to it. It was like, Ty is just not that good. 
just not that. I like him. I like him. He's an exciting fighter. He's incredibly entertaining, uh, just as a personality as well as as a fighter. But like when it comes down to it, just not, not actually that good. Um, but this is heavyweight, so there are plenty of people he can still beat. I have no idea what you do with Volkov after this fight. Like none whatsoever. Because he's a guy who has fought a lot of the absolute top of the division. Like, let me pull up the uh the U or let me pull up the the heavyweight rankings here. These are these are the topology heavyweight rankings. They're the ones I like to use the most. But like, all right, Alexander Volkov has he's ranked sixth on their list. He's already lost to Tom Aspinall, and there's no reason to go a rematch. He's lost to Cyril Gone. There's no reason to do a rematch. He's lost to Curtis Blades. There's no reason to do a rematch. Like, these were definitive losses. He's beaten Jarzinho Rosenstruck, Alexander Romanov, Tai Tuivasa, Marcin Tibera. Um, I guess you could do Jailton Almeida, but like Jailton Almeida is fighting Curtis Blades. And if he beats Curtis Blades, there is no reason for him to fight Volkov. And if he loses to Blades, there is no reason for him to fight Volkov. <laughs> Um, and then down below that, you have Stipe Miocic, Sergei Spivak, who just lost, Marcin Tybura, who he's beaten, Derek Lewis, who I guess that would be an option to go with. Derek Lewis did beat him way back in the day, but it was a fight where he was largely getting the better of Lewis, like throughout the whole thing, and then gassed out and got knocked out, and that was kind of it. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. He's in a weird spot where like, I don't even think he can really be used as a, as a test for people because he's kind of unique. He's kind of a unique outside striker who happens to actually have like a good clinch and grappling game and reasonable wrestling game. Obviously got to wrestle by Curtis Blades, but that's like about it. So like, I don't even, uh, he's, he doesn't even have like the, the standard, uh, heavyweight archetype to test somebody against. It's uh, it's kind of problematic. Um, I don't know. And for Tai Tu Vasa, I got Jarzinho Rosatruck. They're kind of in the same place. They're both heavy-handed strikers. It would be an exciting fight. It would be fun. They're both going to be around. They're both still hanging around the top 10. So, yeah, why not? Uh, Mato Cop versus Felipe Dos Santos. Felipe Dos Santos has nothing, 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 nothing to be ashamed about in this fight. That man came out here and he fought. He took some heavy shots by cop. He was clearly physically overmatched. There was a, there was a moment in the first round where Dos Santos catches a cop kick, trips him to the mat, goes for top control, just instantly gets overpowered and put on his back by cop. Like just, um, it's amazing to watch that. And he's going out there. He's just trying to do everything he can loves throwing, you know, jumping knees and stuff. Getting, but he's just getting picked apart by Cop. I had Cop winning the first two rounds. You could give him the third round as well. I thought Cop did slow down in the third round a little bit. Started to, you know, lag and it allowed uh, Dos Santos to pick up the pace. I'm kind of interested. What was the um, UFC stats, please? Find the right event here. Mono Cop. Are you are you re- are you really gonna make this difficult? UFC stats? You are. I don't I don't even see what I spelt wrong. Um, uh, no, cop even outlanded him in the third round. So yeah, that that would not even really work. So cop went out there, won all three rounds. He got a knockdown of Dos Santos in the first, and Dos Santos just kept 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 coming, kept coming. Dude is a uh, legit find. I appreciate everything he did out there. He Gritted out determination. Awesome. Great. Short notice appearance. Should have owed a earned a ton of love from the UFC matchmaking department. And for him, I've got Clayton Carpenter. Clayton Carpenter is a guy who the UFC seems fairly high on. They're both very, very raw. They're both very, very athletic. Let them go head to head. See what happens. And then this was kind of the ugly moment of the, of the card. Not the only one, I guess. Like, I, I'm going to be honest here. Cop has a le- legitimate gripe and grievance with how his career has gone. This is a guy who should be getting um, title eliminator fights, basically. <sighs> Sorry. A little bit of a sniffle there. 
Um, he should be getting title eliminator fights. He should be out there getting his thing done. And instead he's fighting Felipe Dos Santos in a fight that he didn't get a finish. He didn't get a lot of shine off of because Dos Santos is a madman. I think he did get the fight of the night. Did he, was this the fight of the night? I hope it was because it absolutely should be. Yes, it was. Uh, it was the fight of the night performance of the lights for Justin Taffa and Sean Strickland. I agree with Strickland wholeheartedly. Uh, I do. I just think so little of Austin Lane that I don't know if I can give Justin Taffa it, but there you go. Um, he went out there. He went hard on Kai Carfronts. Like, I will come to your gym and your teammates will do nothing. And this is where we got our second uh, <laughs> homophobic slur of the night. Um, here's the thing. There are people on Twitter who took great offense to this. And and it was kind of funny because Aust- uh, uh, New South Wales, where Sydney is, apparently has a, has a law in the books about not using um, homophobic vilification is their word in this way. So this, this could actually, <laughs> this could actually have a legal case. Um, I don't care. Again, like I know, I know Manal cop is an insane, slightly unhinged person. And him saying that is, not surprising, but I do, I do find it a bit weird that like there's a subset of MMA fans who are like, well, I'm not, um, I'm not homophobic, but man, I am, I became a fan of Monal Cop and Charlie Radke tonight. <laughs> um, particularly with Radke, like with Cop, it's like, all right, he put up a great performance. So like, if you weren't a fan of Cop before and you are now, Okay. You were you maybe became a fan of him in the ring, but like if you're a fan of him outside the ring, for you know doing what he did, like you are kind of homophobic. Like that's what it comes down to. And if you're a fan of Charlie Radke and you weren't before, you're absolutely homophobic because that fight. We'll we'll get to that fight, but that fight was a trash can. <laughs> um, it's just it's just uh, it has always been weird to me that MMA is in fact is infested. That's the word I look for with like um, homophobic like ideas and and uh, fandoms when it's like, guys, we are watching two men. Be, you know, fairly close to naked and in some cases really close to naked, go out there and rub up against each other. In some cases, sit between the other guy's legs in some cases and, you know, potentially shoot for a takedown with their head going basically to another man's crutch. I just kind of have to say, I don't I don't think this is the sport (laughs) for 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 people who are uncomfortable with uh with homosexual aspects of society. I, I, I just, I think that it, that is incredibly weird to me. Anyways, um, for, uh, like I said, cop versus Kai Car France is the answer. Justin Toffa went out there and made me proud. I just said that I, uh, maybe it shouldn't have been performance the night because I have that little respect for Austin Lane as a fighter. Uh, probably a perfectly fine human being and a, and a fantastic athlete. But as a fighter, there's just a ton of hesitation, worry, um, and things that just are not going to lead to good places in a mixed martial arts career and already kind of haven't. Um, Toffa looked way more prepared to deal with the range and the kicks. He looked way more comfortable, way more composed, way more keen to pressure and just land power shots. And then, you know, Lane goes out there, throws a hook kick. It misses. Toffa, overhand, boom, done. Pound him out. Gets the job done. Beautiful. I've got Waldo Cortez Acosta in another professional athlete who is probably getting a little bit more of a push than he probably deserves, but is, you know, fantastically physical. And for Austin Lane, I guess I've got Josh Parisian because that's kind of like 
the ultimate. All right, if you can't beat Josh Parisian, I don't think you belong here. And it's not, to be clear, it's not that I think Josh Parisian is the worst heavyweight in the UFC. He's not. It's not that I think Josh Parisian is a terrible fighter. He's not. It's that given the athletic upside that Austin Lane is going to have if that fight gets made, the speed, the explosiveness, the reach, the length, it is a fight that he absolutely should be able to win. And if Parisian can do what he does and make it ugly and make it grimy and get to the point where like those mental idiosyncrasies, I guess is the word, that Lane has and he crushes or he cracks and he gets beat again. I just think that it's 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 an experiment not worth following. He's 35 years old. I know that's not super old for a heavyweight, but like that's not a lot of time. Uh, Tyson Pedro uh, won. I learned from Ant- about Anton Turcali that the Pleasure Man nickname is from his dad? Question mark? Confusion? I, I don't get it. <laughs> um, I, it, it's a sh- it is a real shame, actually, that Anton Turcali is just not good at fighting. Because every time he comes out, he makes me laugh a little bit. It's the nickname, but it, like it's also like, you know, him crossing himself before the fight is like he's scared for scared to death. And like the weird stories that just keep coming up about the story behind his behind his nickname, behind his journey into MMA. Like there's a personality there that is fun. But he is not good. <laughs> he is he is not good. At fighting. And Tyson Pedro, a guy who essentially has one round in him, went out there, pressured him, kicked his legs quite a bit. And there was like a really painful one where they both actually threw a kick and they got the big shin smash between them. That's got to suck. Pedro hurt him with a right hand, had him rocked, dropped him with a second round. And then, or not, a sec, not, not the second round, but like a second round of like another overhand right. And then hammer fisted him to put him out. Like I said, it's, he's, Turkali just not that good. And like, the problem with this is, Pedro looked good. Tyson Pedro looked good. But Tyson Pedro looks good in the first round generally all the time. It's a matter of like, what does he have after that? And I guess I would put him in there with like Nick Nick and Mariano to find out. Nick is, if nothing else, an incredibly tough guy. If nothing else, a guy who is going to bring um, pressure to Pedro. So how does he handle that with a guy who just isn't going to kind of instantly fold? And with Turkali, sadly, he gets cut. Like, there's, there is no shame in losing to Vitor Petrino, Jelton Almeida, and Tyson Pedro. Those are... Like, Almeida is a legitimate contender in the heavyweight division and the light heavyweight division. Um, Petrino, if he can put some things together, probably will contend. And Pedro in the first round is exceptionally dangerous. So, like, there is no shame. It's just, there is no part of his game that makes me think that he is UFC caliber. And as a result, I assume he's on a four fight deal. Maybe he'll get a fourth fight, but it'll probably be a loss like there's not there's not an athletic upside to him there's not a technical upside to him there's a lot of there's a lot of gameness to him like like he he doesn't have austin lane's problems where like you have all the physical talent in the world and you're just not really mentally cut out for fighting like turkali is cut out mentally for fighting it's just he's just not good like the technique isn't there and the athleticism isn't there Carlos Olberg, Da Un Jung. Um, Olberg took him to school, won all three rounds. Wound up instead of getting a decision, getting a rear naked choke on video review, where it sat, where it showed that Jung tapped out with like eleven seconds left in the fight. Um, this was a really good performance by Carlos Olberg, like just really, really good, good range management. Um, denied the clinch from Jung a number of times. 
When Jung did try to clinch with him, he would punish the belly with knees. He would punish the legs. He would punish with jab. He did fade towards the end of the third round. So there is still a little bit of a, like a cardio question mark to him. Let's see here. He threw 38 strikes in the first round. 50, actually, 372 strikes in the, in the round. But mind you, I think that was the ground and pound really making up a lot of that. Because he got he got um, Jung down and started you know, unloading on him. Um, there was a seemingly little bit of a, uh, a fallback uh, also in the second round even. So like I am still a little bit worried that Allberg has some cardio issues that could be long-term problematic, but like at the same time, he does seem to be working on them and he seems to be coming out better and better every time out. Unlike, for example, the guys we were talking about uh, beforehand. <laughs> um, but he's doing a great job. He's um, he's really, really good. He called out somebody. He called out Dominic Reyes, which I wouldn't oppose... But I as I also just don't want to see Dominic Reyes fight. Like I think Dominic Reyes is just chewed up and spit out. So like I'd prefer something like Alonzo Menafield. And with three straight losses and bad decision making in all of them, um, I do kind of think Jung gets cut. Um, the door is not closed for him. Like he's big enough and technical enough and physical enough that like he he can belong. And if they keep him around, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think that. Maybe he needs to go back to the regional scene and kind of regroup a little bit, find himself. Cause I think I think that Dustin Jacoby fight where he got kind of uh melted, it's really affected him in negative ways. And he's got to figure himself out and figure out what he's gonna do. Cause right now he just he kind of looks lost. Like the Devin Clark fight was like the worst game planning I have ever seen. I I picked him to win that fight. And it was terrible. This fight, I think that even with a proper game plan. Um, he would have still probably lost, but I think like at the same time, there was, there was points where he got lost and that, that ending was not good. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my take. Uh, Jack Jenkins versus Chepe Mariscal. This was a good fight. This was fun. Jenkins won the uh, first round showing off the, the hard, hard kicks. Uh, also won to the balls <laughs> of Chepe Mariscal. Uh, Mariscal was doing his, thing where like he'll hockey style punch you in the clinch he'll put the chaos on you he'll put the pace on you he'll do his thing like it's the thing is like Chepe Mariscal not a particularly amazing fighter but like his style and his persistence and his toughness allow him to just go in there and make anybody have to fight him and everyone uncomfortable anyone he fights uncomfortable and we got more of that in the second round Though with a little bit of wall install mixed in, they get the body lock. Chepe is going for a big, th a big throw on Jenkins. Jenkins posts up with his arm, locks the elbow, and boom, uh, dislocation, serious damage to the elbow. Don't know. Haven't seen a medical report. Don't need to know. Don't want to look at it. Um, that was the end of the fight. Referee stepped in. Chepe Mariscal is two and zero in the UFC. I didn't think that was going to happen when they signed him. He was brought in to lose to Trevor Peak, in my opinion. And now he's out there 2-0. Like, that's pretty impressive. And uh, don't get me wrong. Like, I had Jenkins winning at the time of the injury. But, like, he did the technique that led to the injury. And he um, he made it tough throughout, throughout every point. I still think that there's a hard ceiling to him. I still think that, you know, card-filling action fighter, which is not a bad thing because it's exciting, is Chepe Mariscal's you know, end result here. There's just a lack of physicality to his game. That's particularly a featherweight going to carry him very far. There's a lack of technique to his game. That's going to carry him very far. But like he is, he is the sort of dude who's going to fight up to his level of competition and fight down to his level of competition. Uh, I've got him against Tucker Lutz and I've got Jenkins against Austin Lingo. Although depending on that elbow, that might be a long time away. And uh, <laughs> Lingo ain't waiting for that fight. <laughs> Jamie Malarkey, John, John McDessie. I had McDessie winning, but I have no problem with Malarkey picking up the decision. Uh, was it a split? It was unanimous, wasn't it? Uh, I don't have a problem with that. It was it was perfectly fine. If you look at the if you look at the first round, 
Like Desi landed more, but I thought Malarkey landed better. The second round definitely went to Malarkey, 37 to 21. And then the third round definitely went to McDessie, 38 to 29 on, on landed strikes. It's really just how you see that first round. That's fine. Um, at the end of the day, John McDessie showed up well here, but like a common problem for him came up, which is there were points in the fight where he just couldn't find his range. He's fighting a guy three inches taller than him with a reach advantage of ah, four inches taller than him, actually, and a reach advantage of six inches. He had a hard time finding his way into the fight sometimes. There were, there were times where he was kind of just kicking the air, unfortunately, and then Malarkey would, you know, jab him, throw out the right hand a little bit, throw out his own kicks and do his thing. And when they and then when they tied up a couple of times in the clinch, um, Malarkey was able to just kind of bully him. Also hit him with a jump knee in the third round. That was very nice. McDessie ate it though. McDessie is McDessie is a real one. Like that is not someone you have any interest in fighting because I don't think you uh I don't think you 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 get anything out of beating McDessie often because he's gonna make you look a little silly. I will say this was one of the worst moments for the commentary because uh DC was like just like talking about how like you don't you 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 don't out wrestle John McDessie. You don't do that. You don't and it's like that's because John McDessie's career has been largely consisting of fighting guys who don't wrestle well. Like if you look at the guys who are good at wrestling, they do out wrestle him. Like Dennis Hallman got him down and Rene could choked him. Um, Alan Patrick got him down, picked up a decision. Um, Yancy Medeiros had some success wrestling him, even though he's just more of a big guy than a wrestler. But like you look at the guys he's beaten and it's a lot of guys who just, they don't wrestle. Like that's what it comes down to. They, th- that's not what they do. Uh, the UFC has used John McDessie, in my opinion, incredibly correctly in putting on just exciting fights with guys like Lando Venata and guys like Shane Campbell and guys like Darren Crookshank and guys like Sam Stout, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Like they've done a great job of matchmaking him to make that happen. And even the more uh, recent fight, uh, Ignacio Bajamandes, for example. But it is kind of just, again, another case of like, It, it's just DC just not being very good. And like having Laura Sanko out there with him was like, I think contrasting that Laura Sanko did a great job. She knows the fighters. She does her homework. There are some weird things uh, when she's on commentary, mostly because of the co-commentators who feel the need to, I don't know, try to try to make it a little bit awkward having a woman on commentary, maybe, but, um, but she does a great job and she's getting better. I think every time out, whereas like DC is not getting any better and is not trying to get any better. By the way, like another thing he was doing this fight was like the car, you can't, the, you can't, you can't ignore the control guys. Didn't they make you take a judging course that like emphasized effective striking, effective grappling damage. And particularly in the Charlie Radke blood diamond fight, they like just holding a guy against the cage doesn't really do much. Anyways, I'll stop banging on about DC now. Uh, Jamie Malarkey versus Hoffa Garcia, I think would be a great fight. John McDessie versus Ferris Ziam would be a fun fight. Although Ziam is really, really tall and like sometimes will try to wrestle. So I don't know. Maybe you don't do that with John McDessie, but you put John McDessie in there with any like pred- predominantly striker at lightweight, you're going to get a fun time. Uh, Nazar Hakbarost versus Lenny Quinones. This was fun. Um, I gave all three rounds to Hakbarost. He, I think, outlanded him in all three rounds and I think easily got the better shots in outside of the low kicks because uh, he got eaten up. Yeah, 100, 172 strikes landed. Jeez. Um, I am incorrect. I run, uh, Keon has actually outlanded him in the first round. Uh, 47 to 43. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, he outlanded him in the second and third round. And it was a lot closer than I thought because uh, I have a lot more faith in Hawk Bros than I do in Quinones. They're kind of the same kind of guy in this like super well-rounded, reasonably athletic mold, Hawk Paras more so, but like lacking depth to the, their games. There's there is no there is no one thing that they have layer after layer after layer in. And 
I don't think that really changed. It's just I think Quinones was way tougher than Hawk Paras was expecting and way more game than Hawk Paras was expecting. And also, Hawk Paras got his lead leg compromised heavily with those low kicks, which is a little bit sad because I, I don't think of Quinones as a great low kicker. I guess we'll see. He'll be around for a bit. Uh, next opponent, I've got Hawk Paras versus Drakkar Close. And I've got Quinones versus Chris Duncan. That's not going to happen because Duncan's like actually, I think, won two fights in a row. And is heading for bigger things. But like, I don't know. It's a fight that I kind of like. I just saw Chris Duncan while I was going through the rankings. I was like, that would be sweet. And I don't really know what you do with Quinones either. Anyways, uh, you, could, you could throw some Dana White Contender Series fodder at him. And just have fun with that, I guess. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, this is also where we had uh, talking about the Moroccan um, earthquake that took a couple of lot that that has a earthquake that has hit Morocco that has been quite lethal. So thoughts and prayers go out there as well. Uh, interesting that uh, I didn't realize Hawk Barast had connections to Morocco because I know uh, he's not Moroccan by uh, by birth. He's um, uh, Afghani. But uh, apparently he's facing, a f- he's he's connected there now, and uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. This is a this is a man of like many many nationalities. Like he's born Afghanistan, lived in Germany for like a long time while he was establishing his career. Lives in Canada periodically with like TriStar. Lives in the states in California when he goes to King's MMA and Morocco apparently as well. So like man of like international man of uh, of of uh, of mid card. <laughs> um Blood Diamond versus uh Charlie Radke. I scored this a draw. I gave the first round to to Blood Diamond, which I know is not going to be super popular because it was largely him getting held against the fence, but like when they weren't just leaning against the fence, Blood Diamond was winning. He was landing much better strikes. I want to say more strikes. I could be wrong. Let's have a look see here. No, he was outlanded. They, they they have the same significant strikes in the first round, though. Um, so I'm like I'm perfectly fine with Charlie Radke winning rounds one and two. He lost round three, in my opinion. He also had the point deduction there. Um, or pardon me, uh, Blood Diamond got the point deduction for kicking him in the balls, or well, kneeing him in the balls, I think. And uh, that would lead it to it. That would lead it to a a victory for Radke, I guess. Radke did definitely win the second round. Um. This fight was a trash fire. And then after the fight, of course, we had the um, the uh, Charlie Redke going in, uh, in on the crowd with the uh, the homophobic language again. Um, he apologized for this later, but like, I, I, I don't, it's again, I don't get it. Like, Charlie Radke, Chuck Buffalo, by the way, seriously, drop the, drop the Charles, just call yourself Chuck Buffalo Radke, just go by Chuck. Um, it sounds good. It sounds really good. You hugged a guy for 15 minutes and you want to fight on clinch control and cage wall installing. That's what you won this fight on. I'm not sure you have any grounds for suggesting anybody else is, uh, is gay. I, I don't, I, uh, I don't think that's the case. Um, there are people talking about him getting cut. He might get cut because he's not worth the hassle. Like they they brought him in here to lose to Blood Diamond. Like that was the idea here because there is no reason to book this fight if you want anything but a Blood Diamond win. Like there, if you want Blood Diamond to lose or you want to test Blood Diamond, there are guys on the roster to do that with. You don't sign a guy with a mediocre record and a very journeyman looking like game to fight um, blood diamond and expect that blood diamonds with the, with the goal of getting blood diamond a loss. So like you have a guy that the UFC is not invested in. Uh, I heard he was on a two fight deal. Maybe not. Um, He could get cut. He, he could, he could legitimately get cut. Um, Model cop is safe because the UFC does not care about your language, but like 
at the same time, like the headache level that Charlie Radke causes versus any value he brings is uh, significantly not uh, balanced. I don't care either way who they fight. I don't think Radke's very good and Blood Diamond isn't very good. Like very much like when, when I am picking you to lose to uh, I forget if it was Orion or Lewis, either Koshi. When I'm picking you to lose to either Koshi, you're not very good. That's that's all there is to it. And then when I'm thinking about picking Charlie Radke to beat you, and then he does, um, you're not very good. Blood Diamond might have another fight on his contract. Maybe we'll see him, but I don't care who it's against. I don't. He's a reasonable striker. Like I said in my preview, there was like, I guess, a little bit of a reason to get like a little excited, but like he's 35 years old. He doesn't know how to break the clinch. He doesn't really know how to grapple. He himself engaged in grappling with Charlie Radke, which was exceptionally dumb. He has fought the bottom of the barrel and been unable to come up with a win. So just whew, except for Jeremiah Wells, like his debut against Jeremiah Wells. That's a good fighter. And he got destroyed. Uh, his, his two fights since then, just bad trash fire fights. Don't need it. Um, Shane Young, Gabriel Miranda. Gabriel Miranda took his back incredibly quickly with an early takedown attempt. Gets the rear naked choke. And we're done. And then we got uh, Gilbert Burns, uh, unneeded uh, celebrity uh, translator for Miranda. I was going to say, I, I knew Miranda spoke English, so I had no idea why Burns was in there to to uh, to help him out. Um Shane Young is probably done. I think he's lost three in a row at this point. He's, you know, he's at City Kickboxing. I like him. I, I like the game he's trying to put together, but like he's just not very physical. Oh, four in a row. Whoa. Ooh, yeah. Um, I forgot about the Ludovic Klein knockout. Ludovic Klein, Omar Morales, Blake Builder, and Gabriel Miranda. Not bad fighters. Don't get me wrong, except for Miranda. But not 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 super great fighters. That's not that's not a that's not known for a run you uh, you come back from. And I don't really know. I I, I still don't think Miranda is going to be particularly good. It was cool to see him get a very quick finish here, and that's obviously a highlight for his career. But I still, he's still very much his filler. A guy who crushed cans pretty much his entire way up here with like a. I, I guess a good back take game and like a willingness to like pull guard and go for like aggressive submission hunting. It's fun, but it's not like it's not like testing anybody particularly, and it's not long term. Uh, Kevin Jusset versus uh, Kiefer Crosby. Uh, Crosby looked to pressure him early. Jusset was getting reads, getting things done, starting to find some counters. And eventually started using his jab to intercept Crosby pressure. Although the legs were not looking great. He actually, like, there was a, there was a big bruise on, uh, bruise or swelling. I'm not sure which on Jusette's leg. And Crosby was still doing some things, doing some things, but he was bleeding pretty badly from his nose. The face was starting to tell. He was getting pieced up because Crosby has no goddamn defense. And then Crosby goes for hip toss and like, that's a terrible idea. Why are you trying to hip toss a judo guy? Why are you doing this? Gets tossed to the mat, gets his back taken, rear naked choke, boom. No defense by Crosby to the rear naked choke. Crosby is not good. I don't care. Uh, he, he will get more fights because he's uh, SPG Ireland. And those guys are, those guys are guaranteed to be like, how long was Artem Lobov around in like Kahal Pedred? Pedred. Um, Although they, they were making a big deal about like, this guy's a Conor McGregor training partner. Yes, so was Arden Loboff. So was Cajal Pedred. That doesn't mean anything. Um, Jusay called out Ian Gary. He's not getting that. Uh, I think more someone like Billy Goff is more likely. And I actually think that would be kind of fun because I still, you know, I, I, have, wor I, I have worries that Jusay is still kind of molding into the striker he wants to be and someone like Goff who will put the pressure on him with a little bit more speed and a little more defense than Kiefer Crosby is a good idea 
So there you go. That was the fight. That was the fights. It was pretty good. I'll see you with the pre- preview next time. What do we got coming up next? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? We have got UFC Fight Night. Oh, yes. The Mexican Independence Guard. Grasso versus Shevchenko, too. That's fun. Kevin Hall and Jack Della Maddalena. I like that. Raw Rosas Jr. Terrence Mitchell. As a main card fight is kind of garbage, but uh, it's a good fight. Uh, Daniel Zell Huber, Chris Jos Diagos, Fernando Padilla versus Kyle Nelson, Lupi Godinez versus Luis Reed, Roman Kopolov, Josh Friend, Edgar Shires versus Daniel Lacerda, Tracy Cortez versus Jasmine Jes- Je- uh, Jezavidish. That's cool. Charlie, I don't know Charlie Campbell. <laughs> um, and Josephine Knudsen's on the card. Okay. Not great, but it's fine. And uh, anything cool on Contender Series? Not really. Anyways. Oh, Julia uh, Julia Palestri is uh, on Contender Series. Interesting. I Yeah, she was the one that lost to uh, Jasmine Jazz uh, Didicius on Contender Series before. And she's back. So that's cool. And she has a win over Jessica Delboni, who I think is a really, really good fighter. So there you go. Um, I will see you next time. I hope you enjoyed. And... Uh, Check out the links down below the social medias. We're doing some cool stuff in the Discord server with Super Mega Baseball as well as the Fight Sim. I will see you guys later.